Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks by the New Art School. Our guest today is Predrag Nikolic. Welcome, Predrag. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and uh, to be part of your podcast. I heard so many things about your podcast and how it's influential. So it's really my pleasure and honor to be invited and to have this session today with you and the audience, audience which is listen, who is listening to this, uh, this program. It's a great honor to have you. So tell us about you and your work. Yeah, so uh, regarding my work, uh, uh, first I need to clean snow, which is going to come soon to Detroit. So I live at the moment in Det Detroit. I'm full professor and uh, chair of uh, the graduate uh, user experience design uh, program. Uh, I moved to Detroit uh, recently. Actually, uh, 1st of November will be my first year in Detroit. Uh, US and Detroit is my 10th country I moved in. Uh, and I'm really proud of that. Uh, so before I actually moved to to, to Detroit, um, I lived in Bahamas and um, I'm making fun. I'm saying uh, out of these 10 countries, I always have the same criteria, the criteria, like two criteria. The one was uh, uh, nice weather and the other one was uh, close to the water. And with Detroit, I, I compromise because it's only close to the water, but it's not so nice weather. That's why we need to be prepared for uh, winter storms. Um, uh, I'm, uh, of course, I didn't hesitate too much when, once I got the uh, invitation from uh, College for Creative Studies to join them and to become a chair of their recently established, actually, graduate program, which is uh, only uh, two years old now, so from 2022, one and a half year old, uh, because College for Creative Studies is one of the most uh, influential and prestigious school design schools in US, especially in the field of transportation design and product design, because of course we are we are in the city, motor city, you know, city of big three. Uh, so before that, I worked uh, in industry for uh, last 26 years. And uh, meanwhile, uh, in 2006, I got an offer to join academia and then I decided uh, to join academia. Even, uh, as I said, I worked for industry. I started in a, in a small star startup in Cyprus, and then I moved to advertising. So I worked for Ogilvy. Uh, I worked for J. Water Thompson, Gray, uh, after that Yahoo, and some startups such as uh, Groundlink. Uh, and um, that was like really important experience for me moving from one country to another country because I was not moving from one country to another country as a tourist. It was more professional journey. And at that time, um, so I started in 1996. So at that time, it was really novelty and something which was uh, still in infancy phase and ready to be developed for it was necessary to follow the best players of the market and, and pick up knowledge, knowledge, knowledge from them. And then in 2006, I joined academia, first as a visiting um, uh, professor and after that as a junk faculty. And then my first uh, position as assistant professor happened in, two, in 2008. Meanwhile, I, I, uh, I found out or I saw the opportunity to start with my own research um, because my field is like in between of technology and design and art and society. So it gives opportunity for that uh, interdisciplinary uh, approach. And um, I started with um, user experience related uh, research uh, for the, for example, creative environments, user experience environments, et cetera. And then from 2016, I started with the research in artificial intelligence and how we can apply artificial intelligence in, in actually design and the phenomena of uh, us being together in a hybrid society with artificial intelligence entities. But I hope, you know, we will have more opportunity to talk about that throughout this session. That's fantastic. So tell us the story of how you got into teaching. 
Yeah, so that was actually uh, 2006. And uh, I, I, I'm always saying, you know, actually my plan was to get rich, okay, and to make millions to become millionaires. Uh, to become a millionaire, because um, actually I'm third generation of teachers in my family. So obviously I can't ex ex escape that. So uh, I joined, uh, at that time, as I said, I started 1996 and I started in computer animations and uh, because it was a big hype at that time, especially because uh, 1994, Pixar came up with that technology, like improving technology novelties related to how to use uh, computers and digital media in making uh, uh, featured movies. Uh, the first one I will just remind you was actually Jurassic Park. And uh, of course, it was a big hype. Everybody saw a big opportunity in computer animation. But after one year, I found out that that's actually not so much for me. So I was more interested from the beginning for interactive media. And interactive media at that time was really exotic. So I had that, um, I would say, uh, serendipity, yeah, that I got offered to move to Cyprus and to join a, a full-bladded full internet company, web company, as a web designer. And of course, as somebody, I'm, I'm, I'm always saying, you know, like in history, you have... BC, before Christ, AD, Anno Domini, in our world, you have before and after Google. So at that time, it was like Web Bubble 2, and it was like everybody was talking about, uh, everybody was talking and thinking about the opportunity to get money, including myself, and to become rich. Uh, and then uh, in 2006, actually, um, it was like new school in my home country. So my home country is Serbia. And that new school wanted to start with something different than a uh, public uh, 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 University of Art was doing at that time. So they, they were like private school and uh, they understood that it's really hard for them to compete with a public art and design university. So they wanted to start with something else. So they said, OK, let's start with web. So like, uh, let's offer uh, as part of uh, faculty of uh, graphic design, let's offer courses in web design and multimedia design. And then some of my friends from my uh, 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 graduate studies, they knew for me, they called me. At that time, I was actually moving from Cyprus back to Europe to be more precise to uh, Budapest, so Hungary, because Yahoo opened their research and development center there, and I got offered to join them as a professional service consultant. So I moved to Budapest, and Budapest is very close to, to actually, we are neighbor countries, yes, yeah? so it was like really easy to commute from Budapest to to university, which was in Belgrade. Uh, and that's how I joined, uh, how I joined academia. Uh, and uh, I had like uh, from I, I I would say again you know it was like really interesting journey and a really inspiring journey because from the from the day from day one I had opportunity to innovate things to come up with uh, new courses uh, new minors new majors every university I actually worked for and. In total, it's like three continents and eight universities and eight, nine companies. So every university I used to work, actually, they were inviting me to start something new in my field. So I had that opportunity to have open hands, not always, yeah, open hands, you know, and build something new, including, including my new role as a chair of user experience designer. Which, uh, which is really a huge challenge for me because, as I said, College for Creative Studies is, is, studies is well established in transportation design, product design. But uh, user experience design is something which is really popular, yeah? So it's not only art and design schools, but there is engineering schools and computer science schools which are, like, fighting for that recognition and be recognized in the field. And it was always like that. So everything related to field of digital media design was, uh, first of all, it was always uh, 
embraced on enlightened with novelties and the second uh, facing huge competition from all sides so it's not just design field just ours uh, many other uh, 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 fields yeah are uh, scientific fields are feeling uh, or considering that they can share that with us so and that makes all this game even more interesting academic game fantastic so tell us about the the research project and the work you're currently doing yeah so research was a, a, a reason actually why i left advertising so one of the reasons because you know like advertising is um whoever had opportunity and i know that there is that you had opportunity to work in advertising it's a really interesting environment and uh, of course teaches you a lot of things for example how to handle multiple projects at the same time and multiple clients at the same time which is even more challenging than multiple projects sometimes and uh, but at certain point um, because you know it was really well paid i used to be a regional director for adriatic adriatic and balkan region for ogilvy first and then after that for gray so it was really well uh, supported you know in a sense of compensation plus um, I had opportunity to travel a lot, not only in my region, but as well to travel uh, in Europe. So it was really exciting and uh, something um, which was really uh, uh, capable of keeping you in that in that world. But what I was missing was that part related to novelties, because in advert in industry, once they see that something works well, they simply exploit that. So there is no space to kind of, okay, let's do something super new and let's let's experimentize, let's risk. And I was missing that. And then uh, while I was um, teaching, uh, at that time I was teaching at the same time at the university, you know, Metropolitan University in Belgrade, as well as Bergen Academy of Art in Bergen, Norway. And then once, while I was in Bergen, uh, actually I said, aha, uh -huh, okay. Before that, uh, I was doing my PhD. And then in 2010, I started my first research project related to, uh, related to uh, creative experience in, uh, creative experience in um, uh, interactive environment. But I kind of I skipped that part, and I'm jumping to how I end up with my recent recent uh, uh, res research. So, and at that time, I started to kind of think about it was a slowly, slowly kind of uh, entering uh, entrance of artificial intelligence. And then I decided I got opportunity to join a research institute in Malaysia. That's that's the crucial moment. So I said, oh, okay. So I'm going to quit, you know, from advertising and I'm going to take sabbatical and I'm going to take to research institute and dedicate myself for a certain amount of time at that time, one year, only to research and my research ideas. And I went there and in Malaysia, I joined the institute, IDM Institute in Johor Bahru, just across Singapore. And I end up with really interesting projects. And there, actually, I started to work on, on my first uh, project related to artificial intelligence because one of the main fields of the institute, uh, uh, like which institute wanted to develop and position themselves in the world was artificial intelligence. And then I started with my first project. The name of that project was Robosophy Philosophy. So I cloned, actually, Aristotle and Nietzsche. Uh, I made artificial intelligence clones, and then I, 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 I kind of I confront them, and they were discussing between each other. And what was interesting that uh, once they were discussing, it was not just they were taking uh, parts from their book, like from the books I feed neural network, but actually they were making completely unique discussions. So it was not like we used to use. Uh, uh, different programming platforms like taking parts from the from the from the books of either Nietzsche or 
or Aristotle. It was more, it was like I trained them to become Nietzsche and Aristotle. And then they were discussing the same way Nietzsche and Aristotle would discuss if they would have been in the same, if they would live in the same uh, historical period. And, and that was start. And after that, I was expanding that research toward Botorico, which was the next installation I created. And uh, I was actually exploring, uh, because once we are talking, for example, like today, we are also mimicking. So based on the content we are sharing between each other, we are also trying to follow that with our body and like our gestures. So I said, I was like questioning if artificial intelligence can feel the sentiment from the content artificial intelligence is creating. And that's how I come up with new clones at that time. So it was uh, 2018, uh, two clones like uh, um, Machiavelli and uh, Sun Tzu. And they were discussing about war and diplomacy and Aristotle and Nietzsche, they were discussing about uh, moral and ethics. So all these topics are really hard for artificial intelligence to understand even today. So everything was happening before this big hype, November 2022, chat GPT. And yeah, and then uh, I started to work on another project, Metaphysics of the Machines, then another AI Teltorium. And finally, the project I presented this year at CGREF, I'm really proud of that. Uh, the, the name of the project is Aquaterrestrial Recolonization. When I use artificial intelligence to help us to uh, protect our planet. So like uh, we trained artificial intelligence and environmentalists and uh, we, we, we create that concept around the idea that we are not able to, to protect our planet, planet and to revitalize our planet we are destroying. So maybe that in intelligent entity, which is at the moment technology, can actually become crucial, uh, crucial participant in that climate action initiatives and help humanity to prevail, which is actually the ultimate absurd. <laughs> so because we created that artificial intelligence entity and that entity is helping us to uh, to prevail and to to fix or to revitalize uh, what we actually destroyed. That's very interesting. So, how how do you think that this can happen from presentation to actually to actual application? Yeah. So, in uh, that's so another uh, uh, characteristic of any kind of research uh, which is uh, uh, actually conducted within the field of art and, uh, and design. So despite scientific uh, research, where they are trying to find answers on questions uh, related to certain natural phenomena, in our field, because we are not dealing with natural phenomena, yeah? so we need to create artifact. I would just like to emphasize that my research is not theory, my research is practice-based experimental research. There are certain biases. Whenever you say to somebody, if you are from art and design, people have research. Oh, okay, so you are writing some books, you know, art histories, history of design, etc. No, that's not true. It's possible to have also practice-based research in our field. Uh, so, and the approach we have is actually, we are rather raising questions than answering the questions. So part of, important part of research in art and design is rise, like rising questions. Uh, of course, we can give certain answers. We can give certain uh, contribution to improvement of certain approaches, especially in our field, which is still in infancy and we are developing that. But that's, that's really interesting part of, the, of art and design research to understand. So we are more kind of... Uh, trying to engage people around certain thoughts and certain ideas and certain phenomena, social phenomena, uh, behavioral phenomena, etc. So to answer on your question, it's possible to apply, but that was not the final, that was not the goal of the research. The goal was more to kind of uh, raise the question, uh, uh, kind of uh, motivate people or or like to take people from their comfort zone to start to think about that 
application is possible because we, as I said, we did a practical research. So we train, uh, we train our neural network to re, uh, to uh, actually to reconstruct a West Atlantic, a West Atlantic Ocean uh, floor uh, with the corals because the, the, these corals are now dead because of the all kind of destructions and devastations we 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 have yeah, and we we actually we apply on our uh marine world uh and uh, so we actually managed to reconstruct Hello. uh the look of uh ocean floor like in 60s and 70s before we started with these severe devastations of uh, of marine life oh. and um so we said, okay, let's use artificial intelligence as a, as an AI and environmentalist, as I said, and to see how we can use that intelligent entity uh, to help us protect our planet and to change the way we think about our planet, to involve us in action. So kind of like, you know, the project is not only about, okay, we can reconstruct because that's what we are doing in our project. We are reconstructing ocean floor, West Atlantic, Bahamian part of Atl Atlantic. Once I was in Bahama, I started with that, with that project. So we are reconstructing that ocean floor uh, uh, from 60s and 70s when we didn't have this pollution, you know, an increase of ocean water temperature, which actually one of the reasons how we end up with dead corals. So we use artificial intelligence to actually uh, reconstruct uh, ocean floor, as well as to uh, 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 communicate idea or, or like uh, discuss about the possibility of involving, employing artificial intelligence in that super important issue at the moment, which is climate change and climate action, and how we can we can use artificial intelligence to help us as humanity because obviously we are not capable of, of doing that. And then we use the corals as one of the crucial, uh, first of all, as crucial element of marine cycle of life or ecosystem. But from other side, some, I mean, my, like we have these coral reefs, you know, and, and they are like really, jeopardized with pollution and uh, they're, they're, they're dying. And uh, I'm afraid that nobody is aware of the consequences of that, um, that devastation. And uh, why we choose corals, it's not only because uh, they're really affected with, with this pollution and everything what has happened with the, with the climate change and uh, rising of temperature, etc. But we can revitalize corals. So despite other damages we did, for example, with the nuclear waste, etc., which we can't actually fix anymore. So we are polluted and that's it. And that will that will stay for who knows how many, how many hundred years, you know, hundreds of years. We can revitalize corals. So once I figure once I was reading about that, and one of the one one way to do that is actually to play and it's relevant scientific research from Oxford University to play music to corals of uh, of uh, live corals you can revitalize them as well as to increase the temperature of the water etc so having that on my mind that there is it's not too late for certain certain uh, 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 species on our planet and uh, and the environments we already destroyed that's how we actually say, said, okay, let's see what artificial intelligence can do for us. Beside that, uh, we are doing another thing, and that's related to every project we did. We are, because for artificial intelligence, because it's only technology, of course, it's not some, you know, like human being or some, uh, some uh, uh, entity which is alive and, you know, we can hug and uh, we can go together for a drink, you know, or to watch a movie, etc., so for that technology, a uh, data set is in, 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 like uh, essentially has an essential importance in order to train that neural network to 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 work on something, you know, to to give response to something. So what we are doing, we are dealing with uh, 
uh, domains of knowledge which are still not developed. So once we start to work with corals, there is no enough uh, uh, data we can actually uh, uh, use to train our neural network. So, and that's the, chal the, the challengeable part, you know. So we are actually uh, starting with small amount of data and then the first step is artificial intelligence is starting to generate by combining existing stuff, you know, starting to build actually that domain of knowledge. And that's what's really important because not only that we are raising questions, but we are uh, uh, capable of leaving certain uh, uh, data set to others who would like to, to use that uh, in the future. I'll just remind you that uh, if we are talking about the Lee Mid Journal Center, it's actually prompt to 2D. We, we don't have too much of uh, uh, development in PROM to 3D. And the reason is very simple, because we have enormous amount of photos. And that's why we can have that PROM to, to image. But despite other uh, visual formats, let's put it like that, like video, like uh, 3D world, yeah, 3D objects, etc. We are still lacking in that. Somebody will say, no, 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 we have. All these projects which are presenting to us that uh, soon we are going to be able to create video, prompt to video, which, which we have uh, at the moment with uh, some of the platforms like Runaway ML, but, uh, or for example, to generate uh, 3D objects, which NVIDIA is from uh, kind of uh, uh, promising as well as Google. Yes, we have some developments in that field, but not still. It's uncomparable to what we have with prompt to, to 2D images, 2D images. Fantastic. So how do you bring all this, all this research into your teaching? Yeah, so uh, it like I should say thank you for JetGPT. <laughs> Why? Because if we are talking only about artificial intelligence, uh, part of my research related to artificial intelligence, because as I said before, 2016, when I joined the research institute in Malaysia, uh, I was doing actually research related to inclusive design related to, just to mention that, because I implement that also in teaching. So inclusive design, uh, creative ex user experience design, uh, uh, interactions which were, which were based on uh, location-based media rather than, than, for example, buttons, touch, etc. cetera. So um, every journey, I, research journey I have, and the time I have to digest that in a way which is beyond something uh, we established as a corpus of knowledge in that field. And research is actually moving forward with that knowledge, adding something new to that existing corpus of knowledge. And uh, to somebody who is involved in, in research gives opportunity to digest that and to uh, to start to, to challenge the, the existing knowledge itself. So once I have that result, I'm trying and I, I, I succeeded with that, you know, to employ that in, in my teaching. So just to give example, I like to give examples because it's much easier to understand. So uh, as I said, my first, uh, first uh, interest was in uh, creative environments in particular physical interaction or spatial interaction design. And then uh, I started, as I said, I had opportunity as a pioneer in this field and pioneer in academia, I had opportunity to innovate and everyone was like giving me open hands to start with certain courses. So I started with a course with physical interaction, spatial interaction in a sense of like, okay, we are going to move toward uh, from screens and screen media to to space. And once we move to space, you're opening the whole new dimension of challenges and a plethora of new opportunities uh, you need to explore 
and to treat differently. So you are using certain methods, which, as I said, are well established in intellectual design, user experience design, user interface design. But then we are also always challenged with something new and uh, some new new ideas uh, and how to employ that ideas. For example, design for behavioral change. That's something which usually was not part of a uh, of, uh, corpus of courses in user experience design, et cetera, as an experiment, especially 10 years ago. And that's one of my, one of my specialties and one of my early um, kind of, uh, uh, how to say that, early favorite fields in, in design. And then, then we are coming to artificial intelligence. For artificial intelligence was super hard to actually apply in, uh, in design teaching. Why? Because it's very new field, first of all, you know, just to be clear. We are talking about artificial intelligence, Alan Tudor in 1945, Elisa, first chatbot is from 70s, etc. But actually development of the field starts like significant development. Let's put it like that. Is there a, like in, in actually after 2010, to be more precise, it's like 2013, 2014. Of course, many people will disagree. But I would say that at least uh, applications, certain applications for the first time, like matured applications, not some experiments, etc. I could have seen um, from, from 2014, 2015, and much more actually after 2018. So um, I would say that the field itself has a big hype now from 2022. So it's like almost one, one and a half year so it was really hard to employ. It was much easier to do that, to employ that knowledge and that kind of like um, exploring that as part of, 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 of teaching corpus in the computer science uh, field or uh, uh, social sciences as well as natural sciences. And then we have that hype with ChatGPT, which actually moved Many people, you know, kind of shaked, you know, and we started to think about how to use artificial intelligence in creative field. And that was opportunity for me to apply my research. And actually in College for Creative Studies, the course I'm teaching is artificial intelligence. And I'm really proud of that. Why? Because again, uh, I checked, you know, art and design schools, and I would say that we are really pioneering that field in design education and of course it's a huge challenge and we can we can talk um, uh, afterwards about the challenges of employing using artificial intelligence in design education but um, so I, I'm always saying backbone of my program uh, 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 are actually several courses like sound design, artificial intelligence, rapid prototyping in metaverse. All is connected actually with artificial intelligence, but we have one course which is uh, uh, fully dedicated to how to use artificial intelligence in design, what artificial intelligence should be in our, uh, not only uh, as part of design education, but afterwards in our design practice and how we should explore artificial intelligence. And of course, it's a practice-based uh, practice based course and gives me opportunity to, to share with my students and to employ all knowledge I collected for last, so from 2016, well, seven years. So I'm so happy to actually that the College for Creative Studies had that, uh, uh, how to say, uh, initiative or understanding and gave me that opportunity to start uh, with that, to employ that uh, part of design puzzle, new part of design puzzle in our curriculum. Uh, yeah, and that's now it's a, now it's a, it's a huge challenge. Why? Because more and more we are employing in other courses too. As as a yeah. part of uh, as part of uh, 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 education in user experience design. Recently, I was in Chile, uh, University. Of, I was get, I was invited by University of uh, Talca, and I conducted the workshop artificial intelligence powered user experience design. So it was really kind of for the first time, I um, 
I did that uh, in a way that uh, uh, showing how artificial intelligence can uh, 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 significantly and, and usefully participate in different kinds of um, design design activities or design goals. Yeah, but we need to be careful with that. Yeah, there's huge dispute in US and 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 worldwide about uh, artificial intelligence in creative fields and how to use artificial yes. intelligence without jeopardizing human yes, creativity. Which, which yeah. leads me to my next question is how do you see the future of employment for your students in that context? Yeah, so uh, the biggest challenge at the moment is that we are discussing about copyrights and authorship. When we are talking about, you know, because when you're employing artificial intelligence in a bank, uh, you know, in financial system or in insurance or health system, you can't talk about uh, copy, creative copyright and authorship. But in our field, yes, that's important um, issue we are discussing. And then we have actually two, uh, two different, different um, options or ways or directions to employ artificial intelligence in our design process. Purposely, I'm saying process because process has several steps. And uh, there are certain steps in then that, that process where artificial intelligence can play interesting role or significant role without jeopardizing our creativity and without jeopardizing our authorship of the artifact which is generated on, on, on the end. So what I'm saying to my students, you know, and what, uh, because as I said, it's a very controversial topic, just small digression. A uh, few days ago, I think it's very famous uh, post now on Instagram when one uh, a parent complained because they had, uh, here in US, they had a, uh, uh, it's art and design school and they had some other workshop or a lecture in our, how to use artificial intelligence in creative field. And then they had some final artifacts on, after that. You know. And then that parent complained. He said, look, if I'm paying, you know, like so expensive scholarships for artificial intelligence to do creative stuff for my kids, you know, then, you know, I'm going to complain and I'm going to ask, you know, from the dean, you know, refund. And it's not like that. Ju I will just remind you on something that in 1990, we got one beautiful tool. And the name of that tool is Adobe Photoshop. And at that time, when we got that tool, many people who are without background in art and design and without professional training in art and design said, yeah. okay, from now on, I'm going to be, be creative and I'm going to do some, I'm, start, I'm going to start to design, etc." And then many people got the impression actually that uh, Photoshop is just, you put something in, you put some photo in and then Photoshop do everything for you. And that, that bias is, I'm afraid that that bias is now we have, and actually, and you know that from advertising world, you know, people started to, uh, I would say, uh, uh, underestimate or kind of to look from the higher, you know, like, ah, that's, that, 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 you did that with, a, with like some, I don't know, like computer programs, you know, applications, et cetera, you know, especially all generation of, for example, graphic designers or product designers. And then slowly, slowly, everybody accepts that. And now it's a standard. Yeah. I think that that is happening also with artificial intelligence. So it's a very useful tool. I'll just give you an example. Uh, yesterday, uh, I, I, we have a midterm now. And then one of the courses is Studio 3. And uh, uh, my student, my students with their instructor, they're working on like futuristic solution for autonomous car 2040. And we have some guests from Stellantis, Stellantis and, and Scout, which is again, another automotive, EV automotive company. And you know, like they, were, they come with their ideas, but they did storyboards in Mid Journey. So they use story, Mid Journey to help them to do to make their storyboards, which didn't affect their final artifact, because it's just part ideation part in design process, and they used to speed up, I would say, to increase efficiency 
and their productivity, they use artificial intelligence as a tool. So to answer your question, that's how I see artificial intelligence. Because first of all, it's technology. And second, it's a very useful tool. We are using sometimes that even we don't know that we are using it. For example, Adobe Photoshop. It's full of artificial intelligence now inside, including, you know, like, if you remember that patch and stamp tool, yeah. we were using it, it was like headache, okay? It was painful, you know, like you, you started, then you blew something, oh, you start, you need to undo, 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 and start again. Wow, now Adobe Photoshop came with a solution with artificial intelligence, you just kind of like... You make selection of the of the area you want to to clean something, and then they give you options. How you, do you want fishes to be there or only water to be yeah. there? You press button and you get it. So, um, I think that's something we should be focused on, rather than to criticizing artificial intelligence. That artificial intelligence is going to jeopardize human creativity, because then we are having another problem, and another problem is that we don't understand creativity. And that could be another question we can discuss about. But, you know, sure, coming up sure. with limited understanding or knowledge about something and then based on that to criticize certain technology, I don't see as nothing constructive in that, nothing which will take us to next level, you know. And I understand. I understand. But yeah. do, you think, do you think some employers are going to confuse prompting, prompt designing with designing? Okay. Another interesting question. So all employers are into uh, efficiency and productivity. And that's what they're going to get. And now we are more and more talking about artificial intelligence transformation. Before we had digital transformation, I'm going to take my coffee too now because I see we can do that. <laughs> so we had digital transformation first. And I will remind our audience that Digital transformation is not any nuclear physics. It's just how to how to persuade and how to build a culture in your organization to use digital media, for example, instead of printing and calling by phone, to use emails. Yeah. And that's how we improve our productivity. I mean, you know, in different companies. The same thing is happening with AI. And we can't stop progress. So that's what I'm saying to everybody. We can slow down, but we can't stop it. It's, it's, that's it, you know. So now we are moving to your question. How clients, or if you are working uh, in-house, are going to make the difference between something made by artificial intelligence or human? Uh, but, you know, beside having software, which are developing now, we are developing, I mean, the, the industry is developing, for AI plagiarism, uh, we will not be able to, sometimes we will not be able to detect that. Uh, and that's the same, uh, you know, like, uh, it's the same thing, you know, if you collect some image from Shutterstock and then you did something, you do something in Photoshop, you know, and then you present that as, a, as you know, full, the world is full of plagiarism, you know, just to let you know, I mean, you know, it's a human nature, you know, so... Uh, prompt to 2D, you know, first of all, you know, I don't know, like, I'm sure you tried, but as, as well as others, you know, you never get, if you're a really person with certain idea, you never get what you want. You really need to spend lots of time, you know, of course, to come of up with solution which is going to satisfy you. And I'm going to remind you another thing. While you are doing that, while you are creating proper prompts to get a satisfying outcome, you are creative too. So then we can question, you know, the role of creator or designer. Are we becoming more, because, you know, before it was like, okay, let us see, based on your skill, what you can produce visually, like you with your hands or with your software. And you, uh, beside having your ideas, Sometimes, you know, average idea you could make to be great because you have fantastic skill in visualizing things, you know. Now, designer is having another interesting challenge to channelize or to uh, 
around or to make his idea clear in verbal language, in the in the in in, in textual way, you know, like in a yeah. way that I'm expressing myself. So, and in that case, so if I'm working on my prompts to get satisfying results, result. We are not talking anymore artificial intelligence is creating that artifact because artificial intelligence would never come up on its own to idea to, at least at, at the moment, to create something I'm trying to push artificial intelligence to create with a prompt. And then we are not talking anymore about artificial intelligence solely is creating that outcome. It's co-creation. Mm -hmm. Do you think yeah. that we need to adjust education in this new light at all, the, the way we educate? Absolutely, yes. So that's, that's now a big thing, you know, and uh, uh, I would be open, like I'm open, yeah, and be direct, you know, that uh, uh, many schools, I'm not going to say all of us, you know, yeah. uh, many schools are educating future generations of artists and designers in a way that they are explaining to them that you're something so special that, you know, like humanity cannot survive without you. And that kind of uh, biases and that kind of like centering predefined thinking is something our students are uh, ending up once they graduate. And then they, are, they hope that the world is going to accept them open-handed. And that's not the case. So... As you know, that we really need to fight, you know, to position ourselves as a creative person, as creators, you know, and uh, uh, by uh, being able uh, to use artificial intelligence, uh, I think that, uh, and I believe that uh, uh, our students will be, uh, once they graduate, will be uh, more capable of responding to uh, industry requirements. And that's why we need to have that in our education process, because on the end of the day, we are creating professionals, experts, because they need to have, after that certain time of experience, you know, to become professional. But we are uh, professional, we are do we are prof uh, uh, we are tra we train professionally artists and designers. Part of that training must be their capability to be competitive on the market, they are actually looking for a job. So that's first reason why we need to uh, think and employ artificial intelligence in our educational process, uh, because it will be one of the requirements in the future. It's simple as that, you know. <laughs> so, but also we can employ artificial intelligence uh, in education in a way, that's an interesting topic. Even more interesting that how students, because our students are using it, we can say you can't use it, they're going to use it. Because you can't sit with them at, at, at you know, uh, in their dorms or their homes, you know, and check what they're doing. And yeah. then spending hours and hours uh, to be sure if there is any plagiarism or no, not, and you know, and how you're going to define plagiarism or not. So well, you I can think- check, you, can check, you can check the process. You can check the process. Absolutely, yes. And if Absolutely, and, and yes. the process shows everything. But Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. And that's actually, again, we agree that uh, if artificial intelligence is used in a proper way, you know, and we have knowledge, enough knowledge and criteria to follow works of our students, including process, you know, it's very hard to... Uh, to jeopardize or to use that in a way which is not appropriate. So I think it's, uh, it's up to our, us teachers yeah. rather than students. Because students, yeah. let's be honest, they're always going to try to find some shortcuts, not to say cheating a bit, because that's, I mean, we've been students too, let's be honest now. So if you are under stress, you know, and pressure that you need to complete, you know, like five courses, of course you're going to, try to figure out how to speed up the process. And now, okay, you know, I have uh, artificial intelligence. But what is also a very interesting question we should discuss beside that. So how our students are going to use artificial intelligence and how we are going to track properly their usage, type of usage, uh, their how they are using artificial intelligence would be how artificial intelligence will be employed in our educational process, 
-hmm. And that would be something interesting. So we as educators, how we are going to use artificial intelligence in, in a way we are teaching our students. And I don't have at the moment uh, uh, too many. <laughs> there are several questions to raise, you know, but I don't have. Uh, that's, uh, I think that that's something which is at the moment a bit neglected. We are more focused on how to prevent plagiarism, yeah. which is just a consequence of actually human development and development of technologies we are using. But how artificial intelligence is going to change the way we teach in a sense of like how we are going to employ artificial intelligence in teaching process is something really interesting to think about. Mm -hmm. And I don't have definite answers. Brilliant. So how can our viewers and listeners find you, Frederick? Uh, they can. The easiest way to find me is uh, to uh, to either to check my website, which is uh, my name and surname, predagnikolic.com, or even better to check the website of College for Creative Studies, uh, and then to navigate to uh, graduate programs, graduate studies, uh, and there is also my my email. So once they they come to a website. Even I'm going to tell my I'm going to uh, uh, tell my email, but if if they forget, you know, then they, they can go to College for Creative Studies graduate program in user experience design, and there is also my email. My email is actually p n i k o l i c at ccsdetroit.edu. So uh, and I hope you will also um, uh, put that email as a, as a follow up of this uh, interview. Sure. Uh, as well, of course, LinkedIn, the best resource, you know, and uh, I'll use this opportunity to, uh, because we're talking about artificial intelligence in my work. So um, I have a, a, a strong presence in uh, smart cities and Internet of Things uh, research as this on the on design side. And I started with that in 2014, and I'm so happy that uh, we are going to launch uh, next year. Uh, UX design for smart mobility uh, as part of an uh, online uh, 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 initiative of offering online programs uh, at, at CCS. Yeah, and I'm so, so excited about that because uh, I, I believe, and that's my approach in teaching, as well as how I'm um, building this program that... Uh, Beside the fact that user experience design is like salt and pepper, so you can use it in literally in every industry, in every field, service, service product design, etc. We should start to uh, consider user experience in an inclusive way. So, like, if it's user experience for smart mobility, then we need to focus on like uh, uh, analyzing and and developing uh, that field, user experience design. For that, for that particular purposes. Or if we are talking about mobile applications, if you're talking about VR, if you're talking about metaverse, it sim simply requires uh, special attention mm -hmm. because that fields are now, that phenomena and paradigms on, the, on their own. And they are changing user experience design, the way how we think about user experience, as well as how we are designing, how we are applying our knowledge to to make uh, that um, a new environments augmented re, uh, re, uh, uh, environments from our physical world more pleasurable for for humans fantastic so what advice would you like to leave us with advice yeah that's an interesting question you know i, I i'm not prepared for that question <laughs> so no advice would be uh, I would I would relate my advice to the topics we just shared. You know. So the first, don't be afraid of artificial intelligence. I think artificial intelligence is opening new chapter in our design world, art and design world. And I'm really excited with the certain projects uh, I can I can see and the certain applications, as well as disappointed with many promises which are not happening, yeah? So you have like a bunch of applications of artificial intelligence, and now if you want to use it, you're just getting, you know, it's like 
pre-order, you know, or early access, you know, but still doesn't work. Yeah. So to 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 be open to artificial intelligence, but at, at the same time to understand better artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence can contribute to our to know to, to corpus of knowledge related to to design and uh, and general uh, uh, advice would be that, that to open our minds to everything not only artificial intelligence but everything else which is happening never to forget that we are designers and to literally to consider every problem as design problem that's what i'm saying to my students mm. let's not ignore some some uh, fields and areas or problems uh, we don't see we say no that's not for designer that's actually for for engineer for example no i think that we as a designers we can really participate in every crucial uh, and we should position ourselves and being accepted by the society in every crucial question related to to the future of humanity and the future of our of our communities Brilliant. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And it's been absolutely brilliant. And we're looking forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you so much. It was my, my, my great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.